How is a contract breached? Well, the first thing we need to understand is what is a breach? How do we define this thing we call breach of a contract? Well, a breach is an unjustified failure to perform the terms of a contract. Now, that failure might be something like failure to deliver goods, failure to uh, deliver services if it's a contract for services, failure to complete a job that uh, was described and promised in, in the contract, failure to pay on time, and it might even involve providing inferior goods or services. You know, those are just some examples of, of what a breach might, uh, might be. Basically, it comes down to this. It's a, broke, a breach is a broken promise to do or provide something. Now, a, whenever we do have a breach that's a, uh, alleged in a lawsuit or trying to resolve a lawsuit before one actually gets filed when someone's claiming that there's a breach, uh, that breach, those breaches you, uh, will fall into one of three categories. Uh, we, we have a category of breach by what we call anticipatory repudiation. Then we have something called breach by non-performance. And then finally, there's breach by non-conforming performance. So we're going to look at each one of these three. Okay, breach by anticipatory repudiation. In short, the party that's made the promise is, say, is saying, well, I'm, I'm not going to do what I promised I was going to do. I'm just not going to do it. Uh, and the, the, they could be for any reason why they would want to say that. It, it might be it's, it's no longer feasible. Uh, it might be impossible. We're going to look into at, you know, some of those other concepts uh, will come up in a discussion about um, justifiable uh, non-performance, but a breach is an unjustifiable non-performance, and um, and if you're going to uh, repudiate the contract before you even perform, that's what we call anticipatory repudiation, and you're saying I'm not going to do it, uh, and just notice of that intent to not go through with the contract, just notice of that is the breach. Now, be aware that merely asserting that uh, performance is uncertain or it may be difficult. You know, it might be difficult for me to do this. I, I may not perform. I may not be able to perform. That is not a breach. Okay. Now, what, what about the non-breaching party? When they get this communication, what can they do? Well, the non-breaching party can ignore it and wait and see and see if the, the, the time for performance comes and goes without a performance. And then there's no doubt that there's actually a breach. But they don't have to do that. They can go ahead and uh, treat this notice as the breach and go ahead and make their other contracts to cover whatever their needs were uh, that were otherwise going to be satisfied by entering into that contract. Now, uh, the, breach, the breaching party may resume performance. They may have a change of heart, uh, may decide, no, I think I'm going to go ahead and perform this. They can go ahead and do that. Even after they said, I'm not going to perform, they're still free to perform, do the performance according to the, to the contract, so long as the non-breaching party has not changed their position by entering into a new contract or making other arrangements. Once they've done that, if they've changed their position in reliance on the repudiation, then uh, the breaching party is, is stuck and left with their repudiation, and so they have breached. Now, the most common of the three categories of uh, breach that we've talked about is going to be the second one. It's going to be breach by uh, failure to perform by a non-performance. Now, uh, here and 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 from here on out, we're looking for the terms that's alleged to be breached. Is it in the contract? 
And so here's where you need to understand the difference between an express term, something that is spelled out in the contract, and a term that is implied uh, be because it is there from, from other sources or other reasons uh, for out of fairness that we imply that there is a term in the contract, even though it may not be expressed. So let's first talk about uh, terms that are expressly made in the contract. And so we're searching for the term. When, when the plaintiff has said, you've breached the contract, if it's expressly in the contract, that's what we want to look at here. Uh, most, you know, a lot of times that is very obvious that it's in the contract. When, when like failure to pay. If the contract says you're going to pay this much and you don't pay that much. Well, that is obvious. That's an express term that is, that is uh, very obvious that it's in the contract. But sometimes it's not so obvious what the express term is. And, and that might be because we have this exchange of an offer and counter offer and a counter offer back to that and, and the rejection and the new counter offer, a lot of negotiation going, going along. And so then finally, once you have a contract, you got to step back and say, wait a minute, what terms did we finally agree on with all this back and forth? What's finally in the contract? What, what is it? And so we've got that problem. The best way to deal with that is going to be just mapping it out, the sequence of all the communications. Uh, very similar to that is uh, the, the so-called common law last shot doctrine. And, and this comes up uh, primarily in the so-called battle of forms, where, where uh, someone who needs a, a uh, good or some goods and they send in a purchase order or a purchase uh, a purchase order to to the vendor and the vendor who uh, returns back with uh, either their own counter offer or an acceptance uh, if it's a counter offer well then the uh, the original orderer uh, has has their form and they send it back so you got forms flowing back and forth kind of similar to this offering counter offer well the last shot doctrine is basically saying whoever's last form passes back and forth uh, or if there's action on the last form it's going to be that last form that's going to to uh, that's going to control the the transaction because that last form is the last shot and then of course we have this thing called the parole evidence rule when we when we're trying once again what this is all about is trying to decide well figure out what's in the contract and what's not in the contract what's expressly in the contract and that's what the parole evidence rule uh, also deals with let's take a look at that it's on this next board a lot of contracts are the product of negotiation sometimes lengthy negotiation and so if the negotiations uh, precede the writing, then some, some of the negotiated terms may be unintentionally omitted. And so we're dealing with this word parole terms, oral terms, or they may be written terms uh, that somehow don't find their way into that final writing. And you'll see a lot of contracts have a provision towards the end of the contract that says this writing is the final expression of the agreement of the parties. That, that's an integrated writing. It, that's what we call integration. It's the final writing. And so what happens if the parties, at least one of the parties, thinks they agreed to something and then they look back in the contract and it's not there? It didn't find its way into the contract. Well, are they stuck? Are they prevented from uh, adding, getting that other term into the contract? This is where the parole evidence rule comes in. Parole evidence rule says, in absence of fraud, duress, mutual mistake, ev uh, evidence of agreements or negotiations prior to the final writing cannot be used to contradict or alter the final writing in such a way that it's, that it's adding inconsistent terms. So we can use evidence of those negotiations. We can use uh, evidence that, wait a minute, we also agreed to put such and such in the contract. You know, that might be allowed if you are 
explaining or clarifying, as long as you're not contradicting what's in the final, uh, the final writing, then you may use evidence of those parole terms. Otherwise, if those parole terms, those oral statements, those written statements somehow that did not get into the final writing, those extra, uh, ex uh, those extra statements, if they don't find their way into the writing, uh, they cannot contradict. They can explain, but they cannot contradict that final writing. Now, if a contract uh, does not expressly state the term that the plaintiff is alleging that, that was breached, well, then we're talking about something that was implied that was in the contract. And uh, so that's why I pose the question. If the contract doesn't expressly state the alleged breach, is that condition or is that term of the contract, is that implied some, somehow? By what? Well, by a statute. Uh, sometimes a, a statute for, uh, for work uh, to be performed by one, one party for another. Uh, it's, it's, it won't say that the workers are going to be paid the minimum wage, but it's implied that the workers are going to be paid minimum wage. You know, that might be an example of a statute uh, have, uh, adding a term that is, uh, that is implied. Common law rule. Um, you know, there, uh, a landlord, according to common law, would have, uh, has the duty to keep safe common areas. And if uh, you have a, 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 land, uh, a landlord uh, and a tenant entering into a contract uh, for, you know, a lease contract, the, the landlord, the, the, the landlord's going to have to keep those common areas safe but that may not be found in the contract as an express term. It's implied because of the common law. Uh, the course of performance in the past between these two parties may uh, imply that the past practices uh, are going to be the same as this current practice in, in, in the current contract uh, or the course of dealing in the past, a uh, uh, similar situation. Uh, well past performance would be previous contracts, course of dealing in the past with the same contract, um, it's the same, the same situation. What's the course of conduct of the two parties? Is the conduct, uh, is, it, is it implied that a certain course of conduct should be, uh, is, is in the contract? Uh, custom also, you know, uh, I, I, in my neighborhood, I, there's this uh, bagel uh, bakery and, and restaurant. And when I go in there and get bagels sometimes, they've got bags and bags and bags of bagels from, from uh, some of other, their other customers that have ordered them. And when you order a, a, a dozen bagels from this bakery, how many are you going to get? You're going to get 12? No, you're going to get the baker's dozen. But if you've got a, a written contract maybe between the, that uh, bakery and one of these, uh, their customers that orders big volume, they're probably not going to specify a dozen being 13. They're going to go with the custom of, um, of a baker's dozen. So that's just an example of what custom may be. And so uh, if you find the alleged breach to be either coming out of a statute, the common law, or the past performance, or dealing in the past between these parties, or a custom in, in the trade, well, then you do have, you found your breach, and you can allege that and, and prosecute that in your lawsuit. And then finally, the third one that we have is a breach by non-conforming performance. Um, the promise is performed, but it's late or it may be incomplete. Uh, performance uh, may be substandard to what was promised, in which case we're talking about a warranty. And what's a warranty? A warranty is a guarantee or a promise that provides assurance by one party to another that, the, that there are going to be certain facts or, or conditions 
that are true or that are going to go, that will happen. Like this article is free of defect for three years. You know, you're, you're making representational warranty that it's going to be, it won't wear out in that period of time. So, so you, you can also have breach by, uh, by non-conforming performance. And so, to sum it all up, that plaintiff's allegation of a breach is going to fall into one of these three categories. Breach by anticipatory repudiation, breach by non-performance, breach by tendering a non-conforming performance.